Go ahead, say, I got it. Matthew 6. Don't worry if you don't get a Bible. I'll put it on the screen. I'm sure some of you know that. But hey, we're glad you're here today. And uh, I would just want to share a couple of things that I would love for you to uh, just be praying about. Maybe give you a quick update on what's happening. Uh, first of all is our, our Alliance campus. Uh, many of you know, some of you may not know, but at 5 o'clock every Sunday um, over in the Alliance area at Alliance Christian Academy, we gather and uh, we get to do this all over again. So it's an incredible time of just gathering. Uh, it's a new space for us. Um, as I've shared with most of y'all, the coffee shop we were launching in shut down, and uh, but God opened up an incredible space for us. We've got children's ministry for uh, third grade and below. Uh, just some great stuff happening over there. Uh, we have some incredible volunteers that are coming and helping. And so let me just say this. Number one, uh, that's an update and a praise. And number two, uh, just pray for that campus. You, as you may know, getting anything started, man, it's work. Uh, I was talking to a bunch of pastors the other day, actually a bunch of church planters, and one guy asked, he said, how would you describe starting a church? And here's what he said, it's work. And, uh, and I thought that was a great description because it really is. And so, number one, just pray for that. And number two, um, what's Tuesday? Does anybody know what Tuesday is, by the way? Anybody want to take a wild guess? It's, it's Halloween, that's right. I love the one who said Reformation Day, you're right. But uh, nobody knows what you're talking about. It's Halloween, right? So uh, that means that on Halloween night, people are going to be going to doors, they're going to be knocking on doors, or they're going to be ringing doorbells. And what are they going to be saying? Sure. I'm glad kids are in this service. Like first service, they're like, well, I don't really know if I should say it in church. Yes, they're going to say, like trick or treat, right? And if it's your home and somebody knocks on your door or rings your doorbell uh, and you open up the door, you're going to give them some candy. You're going to go, oh, those are incredible costumes. Oh, you scared me. Or aren't you the most beautiful princess ever? Or what are you, right? But no, don't ever ask that about anybody's costume, by the way. Uh, but what I want you to challenge you with is out on the table right out here, I hope there's some left, there are stacks of invite cards. They're stacked in 50 each. So if you get one stack, that's 50. If you get two, that's... Y'all are quick, man. I love this, right? That's 100. We want to encourage you to get these cards. If you're in a neighborhood where people come trick-or-treating and you are someone who gives out good candy, don't, don't, don't be that other people, all right? Like, here's your lollipop, right? No, like give out good candy and drop one of these invite cards in their bag as well. It's a great way to simply have fun, invite people to church, and do that. But there's another way you can take these, because some of you are going, well, well, we don't really stay in our neighborhood. We actually take our kids out trick-or-treating. Well, you can reverse trick-or-treat with these things, too. You're like, what are you talking about? Well, you're going to go to somebody's door. You're going to knock on the door. You're going to ring the doorbell. They're going to open the door, and they're going to say, you're going to say what? Trick or treat, right? And they're going to give you some candy. You're going to go, oh, thank you so much. Hey, why don't you come to church with us, all right? Or, hey, we'd love to invite you to the mount. Hey, we don't know if you have a church home, but we'd love to see you at our church. It's reverse trick-or-treating. It's the same thing, all right? So somebody, everybody, grab a pile of these cards. This is my pile. You can't have this going in my pocket. Uh, this is going with me to my house. As a matter of fact, I'll probably get another 50 unless you all get them. How many of you are going to do that? Hold your hand up high. You're going to get a pack of cards. Hold your hand up high so we can see the rest of y'all. I'm just kidding, all right? So grab the cards. Cards, take them with you. They're out there right on one of the tables, stacks of 50. Listen, if they're all gone, there's also cards just put around random places like in the table back there. There's piles of cards. Just grab those and take them with you. Be a blessing. Have fun. Enjoy this coming Tuesday. So pray for the Alliance Campus and then get ready to invite. We have 5,000 of those cards, by the way, and they'll all be gone and all given out. I just love simple ways of doing that. We're in this series called Teach Us to Pray. And what we've been doing over the last, well, what's today's date? The 29th. For the last 29 days, we have been looking at the model prayer given by Jesus when his disciples asked him, Lord, teach us to pray. And as we've walked through this prayer, what we've seen are aspects of prayer from this model prayer that we need to be incorporating in every level of our life and of our prayer life specifically. Well, today... 
we bring this model prayer to a conclusion. Don't worry, we've got one more week of the prayer series. And I don't want you to miss next week because we're going to take it from theory to real life practice. But let's look at how Christ closes this model prayer. He says this, pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us of our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Let's look at verse 13. How does Christ conclude and close this instruction on prayer? How how does he... How does he tell his disciples and model for them an aspect of our prayer life that that ought to be what you and I are praying regularly? Here it is. And lead us, what? Not into, say it with me, church, temptation. So can I start by asking you all a question today? It's a very simple question, but I want you to think about it. Students, I want you to think with me this morning. When I ask you this question about your life, don't think about your buddy, don't think about your friends, think about you. Hey, moms and dads, I want you to think about your life today. When I ask you this question, hey, single people in the room, I want you to think about your life and and married people, I want you to think about your life because the truth, no matter where you are, no matter the age, no, no matter the marital status, no matter the pigmentation of your skin, No matter the gender that you are, every single person in this room will face and does face temptation. As a matter of fact, let's just get it out there. How many of you have ever been tempted in your life? Hold your hands up high. Look around the room. Look around the room. 100% every single one of us, right? So every single person in the room has been tempted, maybe is currently being tempted or will be tempted. Every single person will face temptation. I want you to think about something. If you were to, here's the way I like to put it, if you were to go dumb, all right, here's what I mean by that. If, if you were just to go dumb, like we have buddies in my life and, and, and some of them just gone dumb. They used to follow the Lord, love the Lord, but they just dove into sin. Here's what we call, we say, that dude just went dumb, all right? Like you just lost it. Like what, what were you thinking kind of deal? Like if you were to dive into some sin, If there was some sin that was going to ruin or wreck or ravage your life, it's going to come through temptation. Let me ask you this. Don't answer out loud, please. What would it be? Do you know where you are weak? Do you know where you are tempted? Do you know the lure that is out there that is the most difficult for you to resist. Think about that for a moment. I believe most of us find ourselves wrecked and ravaged by sin in our life. When we do, it is because, number one, we haven't thought about how Satan may be scheming us. And certainly, we haven't prayed, Lord Lead me not into temptation. Most people that I counsel with, I I know I joke around sometimes about I'm not a counselor and that's not my gift. It's not my high level gift, but regardless, I still spend time counseling with people. Most of the people that I counsel with never come to me pre-temptation, sin, and going dumb. Most people come to my office when? after. They they come after the fact. I'm in sin. I've messed up. I've blown it. I've ruined it. I've made a mess of my life. Help! But I want to just go ahead and lay it out for young men and young women today, for married men and women today. I want to lay it out for the church today that when Christ wraps this prayer up, By saying, lead us not into temptation, it is not by accident. 
I want you to see this is not a reactive prayer. This is a proactive prayer. Lord, don't even let me go there. And I believe that if we'll begin to make this a regular part of our prayer life, we will be spared a thousand miseries. Lord, do not even let me get into temptation. So what is temptation? I'm glad you asked. Let's define it. Temptation is an enticement or invitation to sin. We make this clear, temptation or to be tempted is not sin, but it rather is an enticement or an invitation to sin. And it carries with it the implied promise of a greater good to be derived from following the way of disobedience. Temptation is taking what God says don't and saying, but you should. Temptation is taking what God says do and saying, let's do it differently. Temptation is the enticement or invitation to sin. When I was thinking about temptation, I was thinking about when I was younger, growing up, um, before I graduated high school, I was living with my parents and we had about nine acres and we had a pond on our nine acres of land there. And and a pond, we would go out to the pond and we would fish. Now, I'm not a fisherman, I don't claim to be, uh, but, but back in the day, I did enjoy going out there and just fishing. Now, in order to fish, you need what? You need a rod, And not just any rod, you need a rod, and you need on that rod, you need a rod, you need a reel, right? Unless you got a cane pole, anybody remember what a cane pole is, right? But even on a cane pole, you need what? You need what? Anybody? You need line, fishing line, and on the end of that line, you need a what? You need a a hook, right? And on the hook, you need what? Bait. Bait. Like everybody knows that, right? Do you know what bait is? Bait is temptation. Bait is temptation. We call them lures. Why? Because what is the goal? What is the aim? What is the purpose of a lure on the end of a hook that's on the end of a line that is attached to a reel that is put on a rod? What is the goal of a lure? To catch the what? Fish. To lure them out, to attract them, look close, to entice and invite the fish out of their natural habitat to come and whoom, grab the lure. But what's lurking under the lure? Ugh. This is exactly what temptation is. Temptation is the lure cast in front of us by the great tempter that desires to bring us out. Now, I know... Apparently, the, well, the rule of the day is catch and what? Really? That was not the rule when I was growing up, by the way. When I was growing up, it was catch, kill, and eat. Yes, anybody remember those days? Thank you so much. It's called population control. So we would go and we would catch the fish. And my desire in catching the fish, doesn't matter how big or small it was, It was never to catch and release. It was to catch it, to kill it, and to cook it, and to eat it. Do you know what Satan's goal is with lures and temptations in your life? It's not to catch you and to release you. It is to kill, steal, and destroy you. This is what temptation is all about. And temptation shows up real early. Genesis 3. The Bible says, now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, read these four words with me, church. Did God actually say? If I was you and had my Bible open like I know all of you do and my pen out and notes ready, I would take my pen and I would underline those four words and I would highlight those four words because it is with these four words that every temptation starts. Did God 
really say? Remember, temptation is the enticement or the invitation to sin. Sin is disobedience to God's word. And if Satan is going to lure us away from obeying God's word, he's going to begin by causing us to doubt God's word. Did God really say? Did he really say you should not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpents, Well, we may eat of any fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. So Satan replies, Satan launches doubt, lures us out. We reply, and then he takes the next step. He goes from causing doubt to what God says to flat out denying what God says. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. What did he just say? God is a liar. Let me tell you how temptation starts. It starts not by calling God a liar. It starts by causing you to ask, can I really trust God? Is is God really know what's best? I know the Bible says this, but... It is the doubt that leads to denial. He says, you will not surely die. It goes from, did God really say, to God didn't really mean what he said. It goes from doubt to denial. And he says this, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God and you'll know good and evil. So temptation comes on very early in the scriptures. Very early in life, this temptation, this lure is cast out in front of the woman. God said, don't, but did God really mean it? God said, don't, but God's a liar. God said, don't, but God's holding out on you. This is the way temptation works. And temptations only come in three forms. You probably want to write these down. You see them here in Genesis 3. We see them in Luke 4. We see them again in 1 John 2. Satan has zero new avenues of temptation. Temptation is always traveled down one of these three roads. It just looks different in every generation. I like to say it like this. Temptation has new roads, no new roads to travel. It just has new vehicles by which to drive down the same old roads. Here are the three roads. It shows up in Genesis 3. So when the woman saw, so the lure, the temptation's out. What did she do with the lure? She saw it. And when she saw it, what's the temptation? When she saw it was what? It was, say it, good for food. That's avenue one. Lust of the flesh. Write it down. Here's avenue two. And that it was what? Delight to the eyes. Number two, lust of the eyes. Lust of the flesh. Good for food. Delight to the eyes, lust of the eyes, and that it was a desirable to make one wise. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. Write them down. Those are the only three avenues temptation ever take. Satan has no new tricks. He just wraps it in new packaging. There's nothing new. He's... He's he's very crafty, but listen to me close. He is not creative. Anytime you are lured to sin, it will travel down one of these three roads. Either it will be the lure of the lust of the flesh, the lure of the lust of the eyes, or the lure of the pride of life. 1 John chapter 2 says it like this. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Now look close. He's talking about the world and the things of the world, the things that you and I should not be chasing after, should not desire, should not want, should not be trapped by. But look at this. For all that is in the world, what's in the world? Desires of the flesh, lust of the flesh. 
The desires of the eyes, lust of the eyes. The pride in possessions or the pride of life, it's not from the Father, but it is from the world. This is exactly the temptations that Jesus faced in Luke 4. Look at what he says. He says, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days being tempted by the devil, and he ate nothing during those days. And when they had ended, he was what, church? He was... He's hungry. He didn't eat for 40 days. I'm thinking I'd be hungry too. So we know he was hungry. And look at what Satan comes. Satan comes and he tempts him, first of all, with the lust of the flesh. The devil said to him, if you're the son of God, command this stone to become bread. What is he applying to right there? He's coming after his appetite. He's coming after his flesh. Hey, hey, I got something for you. I know you're fasting. I know, I know what you're doing. I know you're seeking the Father during this time. I know you're full of the Spirit, but let me just entice you with something. Because I know you can. Turn this stone to bread and eat. It's a lust of the flesh. Lust of the flesh is a God-given desire where we are tempted to fulfill that desire in an ungodly way. Lust of the flesh. It is to fulfill a God-given desire in an ungodly way. Is hunger a God-given desire? Yes or no? Yes. Is overeating the right way to fulfill that desire? No. Is undereating the right way to fulfill that desire? No. God-given desire, hungry, fulfill that in a God-given way. Temptations come in all shapes and all sizes and all forms and all facets, but it's this avenue of the lust of the flesh that Satan tries first. Jesus said to him, man shall not live by bread alone. Temptation, battle. Temptation by Satan, battle with Scripture. Temptation, Battle. Temptation, battle. And the devil took him up. And he showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And here's what Satan said to him. To you I will give all this authority and their glory. For it has been delivered to me. And I'll give it to whomever I will. If you then will worship me, say it with me church, it will what? All Be yours. Lust of the eyes. He showed him all the kingdoms of the world. Here it is. You can have it all. Well, Jesus answered him. Temptation, battle. Jesus answered him. It is written. You shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. So he took him to Jerusalem. He set him on the pinnacle of the temple. And here's what he said to him. If you are the son of God... If you really are who you say you are, then throw yourself down from here. What is this? It's the pride of life. Oh, oh, you're the child of the king, huh? If you're really the son of God, prove it. Prove it. Prove yourself. Prove your title. Prove your worth. Throw yourself down from here. And Satan tries something even trickier. He uses scripture. But he pulls it completely out of context. And he twists it and he manipulates it, which is exactly what he will do. Look what he says. He says, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you. And on their hands they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against the stone. Well, Jesus answered him. It is said, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Now, when the devil had ended every temptation, I think that's interesting, every temptation... What, what, in the, he, he, he's exhausted. He's tried his three avenues. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. And Jesus resisted every one of them. And when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. He said, I'll be back. I'll be back. Temptation, battle, victory. Guys, ladies, I want you to realize and remember that there is a lust of the flesh 
The works of the flesh are described for us in Galatians 5, 19 through 21. Just look on those because when you think of lust of the flesh, these are the ways they, they manifest themselves. This week, I'd encourage you to look over Galatians 5, 19 through 21 and see which temptation or which actual sin act you may be prone to fall into. Thus, you'll know that one of the greatest areas of temptation maybe in your life or is, is in the lust of the flesh. But then there's the, there's the lust of the eyes. Think of 2 Samuel eleven two 2 when, when David went out on his, his balcony and he saw who? Bathsheba. His lust of the eyes. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes. And think about the pride of life. Pride of life, Isaiah 14, 14, we're told that this angel said, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. One of the greatest temptations in our life is to be God, to be like God. As a matter of fact, there's, an, there's entire religions and Christian cults that are built around this idea that you one day will be your own God. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. How are you most tempted? Which avenue is most appealing to you? Where is it that your battle is fought? Where is it that you have to truly lay it down and be aware and put guards up against every single person in the room is tempted. We are all tempted on many different levels. But most of us are prone to bow down and give in to one of these. One of these tend to be especially attractive or luring to us. These are the avenues that temptation travel down. So where does, where does temptation come from? We, we know that temptation ultimately comes from the tempter. But the scripture doesn't just give all the credit, if you will, to Satan. He doesn't give it all to the tempter or the devil or the serpent. As a matter of fact, in James chapter 1, the Bible says, Let no one say when he is tempted. Remember, temptation is that invitation, that enticement to sin. And with that invitation is this promise of a greater good or more enjoyment than actually not sinning. It's the promise. It's the lie. Let, let no one say when he's tempted, I'm being tempted by God. Temptation does not come from God. Tests, yes, they do come from God. Let me explain the difference real quick between a, between a, uh, a test or a trial and a temptation. What is the goal of temptation? Steal, kill, destroy. Yes, sin. The goal is sin. What's the goal of a trial or a test? It is not sin, but it is sanctification. The goal of temptation is to drive you away from God. Goal of trials and testing are to drive you to God. Everybody got it? Say got it. So, so let no one say when he's tempted, God, God's tempting me. I sinned because God tempted me. No, God didn't tempt you and God is not tempted by evil or does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted, oh here's our word, when he is what? When he is lured and what? Enticed by what? His own desire. By your flesh, by what you want. I want it. I need it. Now look at what happens when you give way to this desire. Temptation comes. You choose not to battle. You choose not to fight. You choose not to go to war against it. You choose to give in and dive in. Desire, when it's conceived, when it has conceived. So temptation, desire, they have a baby. And that baby has a name. And its name is what? Sin. See, temptation is not sin. But when temptation coupled with desire, when they meet together and they hook up, they have a baby and that baby has a name and its name is sin. And sin is not cute and it's not cuddly and it's not hell. 
No, what is sin? Sin, when it is full grown, it brings forth what? Death. See, see let's just trace it back. Some of you sitting here this morning go, how did I get in this situation? Temptation, fleshy desire, hook up, have a baby, sin, sin when it's full grown. You continue to nurture it. You don't confess it. You don't repent of it. You don't deal with it. You don't you ignore it. You deny it. Or you secretly feed it, and eventually it will kill you. It do, don't, please, please pause for a moment and let me say this. You don't dodge this reality. Some of you are sitting here going, oh, no, I'm getting away with it. Like nobody knows. I've been getting away with it for years. And and nobody's caught me yet. One, you're already busted. Like God has never not known. God has always been aware You may be fooling everyone around you, including yourself, but you've never once fooled God. He already knows. And let's just go ahead and pause for a second and give it the better reality. And you already know you're dying because of it. You know your soul is dying. You're not getting away with it. It is eating you alive. So how do, we, how do we fight sin? How do we fight temptation? How do we battle against temptation? Three ways, I believe. Prayer, word, and the spirit. Here's how we do war against temptation. Temptation's going to come. Look at your neighbor and say, you will be tempted. Go ahead and tell them. You will be tempted. Go ahead. Tell them. If you didn't tell them, please let them know. You, you're not going to dodge this, okay? You will be. I don't care how high, mighty, holy you think you are. Jesus was tempted. You will be too you got to fight temptation with prayer, with the Word, and with the Spirit. Proactive prayer, yes, lead me not into temptation, but in Luke twenty two forty, 40, do you remember Christ, before he went to the cross, went to the garden, in the garden, Mount of Olives, he brought his disciples with him, and verse 40 says, and when he came to the place, he said to them, what? Pray. Pray that you may not what? Enter into temptation. It's the big picture here. Pray. Temptation's coming for you. Pray that you don't give in to it. Pray that you don't bow down to it. Our first weapon to win against temptation is proactive, preemptive prayer. How many thousands of miseries would we have not had to walk through had we made this simple prayer a routine of our life? Lead me not into temptation. How many times have you known someone who gave in, bowed down, and ruined themselves and their family and their life by giving into temptation? And all along, you said this I saw it coming. How did they not see it coming? They didn't pray. Number two, the word. You're like, Ryan, you're always talking about the Bible. Yes, <laughs> you're welcome. Psalm 119.11 says, I've stored up your word in my heart, not my head. I haven't just memorized verses to win Bible drills. I've stored it in my what? Heart. I've marinated on the scripture. I don't just have Bible verses to spout out from my head or to get cool Instagram quotes out. I have it because it's hidden in my heart. It's, it's, it's changing my life. It's reshaping who I am. And I've stored up your word in my heart that what? I might not sin against you. How do we fight against temptation? On our knees and in the word. And then we walk that out by the spirit. I say to you, walk by the Spirit. In other words, live in obedience to that which you're marinating on and meditating on by the power of the Holy Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. This is how we war against temptation. You you, you get on your knees, you get in the Word, and you walk out what the Lord has put in you. 
Many of us are just getting whooped by sin. We have no power over temptation. Why? Because we're not praying. It should be a level like, like I've never known a person who was diligently, faithfully praying against temptation that one day said, wow, man, I don't know how I ended up in the bed with another woman. Most people do it because they're not being proud. They're not diligently praying. They're not warned against it. Oh, get, get on your knees. Get in the word. Like, I just find it, I find it incredibly difficult, I would imagine, to look at porn and read your Bible at the same time. Is that just too real? I mean, is that just too real for y'all? You're like, man, I just can't. I just I pick, I pick up my phone. It's just there. Like, put your phone down. Pick up your Bible. Like, read the Word. Marinate on it. Let it rest in you. You're fighting whatever sin it is. I don't know what your sin is. I don't know where your struggle is. I don't, I don't know what you're battling with in your life. But if you're not praying and you're not in the Word and marinating, it's work. It's war. We're like, can't we just, like, pray and be done? It's war. It's daily battles. This is why he says, lead us not into temptation. But I see another part of this. Right? Like once proactive, it's like, Lord, don't even let me go there. And this is where some of us go, man, I'm already there. And here's your prayer. Well, deliver me from evil. Or some translations, which you, we, we can't tell whether it's evil or the evil one by, by the, by, by the uh, gender of the actual uh, word. We don't know. We don't know if it's evil or evil one. I say yes, it's both. Lord, deliver us from evil and the evil one. I, I see this as proactive and this as, oh, no. This is a, I'm, I'm in. See, see, sometimes, sometimes the truth is we don't win against the temptation. We don't, we don't, we don't win. We lose. We, we bow down, jump in, head first, into sin. And then we're in the middle of it. It's like when I was little, <laughs> I was the youngest brother. I have a, a, a full brother and I have a stepbrother. And we were all at the house one day. And here was the very simple instructions my dad gave. It was so simple, it was stupid. Don't get in the mud. Right? It's not, it's not hard. I even knew what that meant. My brothers, you know, dumb and dumber, they love, they love to use me as the guinea pig. So out by the rose bush trellis, there was a hole. No idea how the hole got there, but in the hole, it had been raining, and in the hole, there was mud. And my brother said, I'll give you a dollar. <laughs> Lust of the flesh. Lust of, yeah. I'll give you a dollar if you jump in the mud puddle. A dollar? Some of you go, a buck? You're like, shut up. All right, that used to be a lot of money, all right? <laughs> Anybody remember when a dollar was a lot of money? Anybody remember that? Yeah, all right, all right this guy, all right, good, all right. He's like, so I, I'm in. The moment I jump in the mud, I look at the house and my dad's standing at the door. Sometimes we find ourselves in the mud puddle that we were commanded directly without question not to jump in. We find ourselves in the mud puddle and we don't know what to do. And we're praying deliverance prayers now. Like if I could, Lord, just beam me up right now. Like just that calls my dad blind him right now. He has not, right? Right? <laughs> I'm praying, Lord, deliver me from the evil that's about to go down on my backside. All right? But this is where we find ourselves. Some of us tempted, and instead of fighting and winning and, and, and victor victory, we find ourselves in sin. And now we need to pray, Lord, Lord, not, not, not don't lead me, but Lord, now, now deliver me. 
See, see, no temptation has overtaken you that's not common to man. God's faithful. He won't allow you to be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation, he'll provide a way of escape that you may be able to endure. Now, now, there'll always be a way of escape, but sometimes we don't choose the way of escape. But there's always a way out. If you're a follower of Christ, listen to me close. You can never say I had no other choice. You always have another choice. But the truth is, in our flesh, in ourself, we don't always choose the way out. We jump in head first, and now we need to lean on Hebrews 4. See, because we don't have a high priest who's unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. We're all weak. We all have temptations. We all are prone to wonder. We don't have a high priest who's unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. And this should not drive us away from the cross. It is meant to drive us to the cross. Because here's what he says in light of this reality. So let us then with confidence, what church, draw near. Draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us when we're smack dab in the middle of the mud puddle. And so I don't know where you are this morning. Maybe there's some lure that Satan just keeps casting in front of you. He keeps just throwing it out there. Keep landing right in front of you. Keep landing right in front of you. He keeps throwing and he keeps luring. He keeps throwing. He keeps throwing. He keeps throwing. Maybe today you just need to pray for grace and strength to resist the temptation another day. To resist the temptation another time. Can I encourage you to make proactive prayer against temptation a part of your daily life? Lord, lead me not into temptation. Leave me not into temptation, Lord. Lord, keep it away from me. Make that proactive. But some of you right now, you, you, you're already in. You're, you're knee deep, covered in mud, head to toe. Show enough filth. And you need to pray this morning deliverance prayers. Lord, deliver me from the evil one. Wherever it is. The answer is the same place, on your knees, crying out to the Father. So can you just bow your heads this morning? And as you do, I want to ask you just to be honest with me and honest with yourself and most importantly, honest with the Lord. You're in here, you say, Ryan, there's just a temptation in my life that keeps being thrown at me. It's there. It's real. It's just temptation. Ryan, I'm prone to give in to it, but I don't want to. Ryan, would you, would you just pray for me? I'm, I'm just getting worn, and I need the Lord's help. I need him to, to lead me not into temptation. So, so Ryan, I, there's just temptation in my life. Would you pray for me? If that's you, nobody looking around, would you just lift your hand up this morning and say, Ryan, pray for me. Awesome. Just put them up. Be honest. Thank you. Thank you, man. Just the temptation, lust of the flesh. Maybe it's lust of the eyes. Maybe it's a pride of life. I'm going to pray for you. Those of you that continue Satan throwing the lure out, but some of you right now are saying, Ryan, I'm knee deep. I'm dirty, man. I'm muddy, man. I'm in the middle of evil, and I need God to deliver me. I'm not being tempted. I've given in. And in all honesty right now, Ryan, I just want God to deliver me. Would you pray for me with no one looking around? If that's you, would you be honest and just, would you lift your hand up, right up, right down? Thanks. Thanks for just being honest. Thank you. Hey, God, you see not just hands. Lord, you know life. You know details. You know situations and circumstances. God, you know right where everyone in this room is. And so, Lord, I pray on two fronts this morning. Number one, would you lead us not into temptation? Would that which is alluring to us become disgusting to us? Would that which is enticing to us Would it become repulsive to us? Lord, by your spirit, would you do that work in our lives? And secondly, Lord, I pray right now for those in this room who are just covered. 
they've jumped in the mud puddle. Father, I pray today they would not run from you, but they would run to you. They would run from sin, flee the wickedness, and they would chase after the Father and come to you. So Lord, I pray in Jesus' name that you would bring deliverance this morning. In Jesus' mighty name.